amendments the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and uh, promote our rights. It's already the UN Disability is the first human rights convention in which the EU has become a party. The Disability Strategy of 2010-2020 was intended by the EU to serve as an implementation plan for the convention. However, the UNCRPD committees observed what we ought to have and will continue to advocate that there are considerable gaps in implementing the CRPD by the European Union. In areas where the European Union has limited competencies or where there was no political consensus, the disability strategy of the previous decade was limited in relation to the actions and concrete proposals made that did not cover all the articles and rights entrenched in the Convention. In an effort to address these gaps in March 2021, the European Commission adopted the strategy for the rights of disabled persons for the period 2021-2030. The objective of this strategy is to progress towards ensuring okay, ensuring that all disabled persons in Europe enjoy the human rights, have equal opportunities and access to a society and the economy, and are able to decide where, how, and with whom they live. This is the most important issue for independent living movement and philosophy. This new strategy takes into account the diversity of disability, comprising long-term physical, mental, intellectual, or sensual impairment, and contains an ambitious set of actions and flagship initiatives in various domains, such as the introduction of European and and accessibility in Europe. For me, of the most important priorities that this strategy embodies is the right to have a decent quality of life and to have independently, focusing notably on the destabilization process, social protection, and non-discrimination at work. To this end, the implementation of the 2022 UN guidelines on destabilization, including in emergencies, is vital. These guidelines intend to guide and support states parties in their efforts to realize the right of disabled persons to live independently and be included in the community while planning the stabilization process and prevention of instabilization. They draw on the experience of disabled persons before and during the COVID-19 pandemic. We highlighted the harmful impact of institutionalization and the violence, neglect, abuse, ill treatment, and torture, including in some cases, chemical, mechanical, and physical districts. These guidelines need to be followed by the European Union when implementing the new disability strategy, as it will help provide clear guidance on how EU funding should be used towards destabilization and independent living, and not on the innovation of these instruments, of these institutions. It is true that in spite of the advances, several issues remain unsolved or addressed in the new disability strategy. For example, discrimination in accessing health care is not met with concrete actions. Moreover, not all member states have introduced the concept of personal assistance. My country has only recently established the right to personal assistance, but I'm still 
expecting from the EU to publish the relevant directives to give concrete guidance on how the member states should provide this assistance. Last, but certainly not least, it is, out more, uh, it is of utmost importance that as the same persons we involve in the drafting of regulations or guidelines that concerns our rights as well as the implementation. This is why all of us being here today is so, so important. We shouldn't be afraid of claiming the rights, of taking full advantage of education opportunities, or of simply going out and joining social, social life. But most importantly, we have a duty to call out the issues, and we need to speak up for ourselves with our voice rather than relying on others. We need to make ourselves heard. So this is these three days, please do make yourself be heard. In addition, I would like you to be aware of my eagerness to help in my way I can. For 15 years now, I'm a member of an EU and I used to be a board member. Being an MEP does not put me in a more distant position, but on the contrary, provides me with more opportunities to be involved, to engage, and to make our society fully inclusive. Thank you very much, and uh, be, I'm very, very glad to have your questions and to have a discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Celius, for this uh, stirring speech and bringing us back to the independent living philosophy, which I think is so crucial in bringing us um, all together here today, today, which is to the heart of Brussels. Um, at quite a critical time, I think, for the European Union, as it is currently in the process of undergoing its second periodic review under the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So thank you very much, uh, Stelius, for setting out the direction of travel for us, where we have come from, but also that we have a long way um, to go. I'm very, very happy now to hand over the floor to my colleague, Juan Ignacio Perez Bello from the International Disability Alliance. Juan Ignacio, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen. And let me begin by thanking very much the invitation to, to the European Network on Independent Living to this event. For me, it's a pleasure to, to attend this uh, first day of the week. And uh, I hope that uh, out of it, uh, there is uh, learning experiences for everybody. And of course, a very successful demonstration and hearings throughout the rest of the, of the week. And congratulations already for the work that you will be uh, undertaking. I work for uh, the International Disability Alliance, which is a global uh, organization, which is an alliance of 14 global and regional organizations of persons with disabilities. At the European level, of course, you might uh, know and have information around the European Disability Forum, which is one of the main uh, members of the Alliance. But together with the European Disability Forum, there is also uh, eight global organizations and five other regional organizations representing all the different uh, disability constituencies. The, the International Disability Alliance was uh, born out of the negotiations of the convention and uh, set two offices in Geneva and New York <clears throat> with the target of advocating on the rights of persons with disabilities at the uh, United Nations uh, processes with a unified voice. And that's what we do, dividing, uh, of course, the offices on different uh, areas of work. My concrete area of work has to do with United Nations uh, Treaty Vice, 
and uh, my main roles have to do with supporting national organizations of persons with disabilities in participating before the different uh, United Nations treaty bodies. So we will discuss a little more what they are exactly and how relevant they might be. Uh, of course, mainly the uh, CIPD committee uh, processes, the Committee on the Rights of the Persons with Disabilities. Uh, and then also advocate on behalf of the Alliance of different uh, processes, uh, thematic processes that the different committees undertake. We were uh, mentioned, uh, mentioning just before the CIPD committee process on guidance on the institutionalization. That would be one. And like that, there are many, many others of the different committees. Um, of course, the main focus of our work is the CFPB committee. Uh, I see some familiar faces of colleagues here in the room that might have participated before in the reviews of their own countries. Um, so it's, that's uh, great that you are here also to share uh, your thoughts and experiences in the, in the segment of discussion. But for now, I just would like to highlight for those of you that might be new to the, to the area that the CFPD, the Committee on the Rights of the Persons with Disabilities is one out of uh, nine different uh, human rights committees. The committees work with, uh, this is similar for all the different committees that I will be mentioning, but focusing on the CFPD committee, the CFPD committee has 18 members coming from very different uh, countries, which are uh, elected by state parties to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And of course, uh, here there is already one point in which each country is relevant because the selection of members then leads to the quality uh, and the thematic interest of the different committee members. Um, uh, it's important to know that the committee doesn't work all the time of the year. There has only two sessions per year in which they have official meetings and have dialogues with states and thematic work, but they count with a secretariat that functions throughout the year and is uh, provided by the United Nations Office uh, for, um, of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. And uh, of course, the, the focus of the, of the CFPD committee is on rights of persons with disabilities. But then we have many other committees and part of uh, the work of IDA is to try to promote the participation of organizations of persons with disabilities in those other committees. And uh, of course, with different thematic scopes, just to mention an example or two, we have, uh, of course, the Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, and uh, AIDA, and also, of course, the European Disability Forum, work to try to support the organizations for the, to participate, to engage in those processes, and influence the outcome of those processes, meaning the recommendations that come from the CEDAW Committee, that's how that's called, to the country, so that it includes issues connected with the rights of women with disabilities in that particular case. And in that way, we have uh, many, many others, the Committee on the Rights of the Child and following the, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, Human Rights Committee following the International Covenant on uh, Civil and Political Rights, and a couple more. Of course, each country might have ratified different treaties and the opportunities might differ depending on which, uh, from which country you are. But I, I cannot highlight more the relevance that uh, organizations of persons with disabilities seek to engage with those other committees as well. Especially because if, they, if, we, if we do not, uh, then we run the risk that nothing is said to the state on the rights of persons with disabilities by that committee. One clear example that we will be discussing also later this afternoon, I understand, uh, is on Belgium. The Human Rights Committee did not say absolutely anything on the rights of persons with disabilities. And as we all know here, if we are not mentioned uh, in, the, in the work of these committees, it's a lost opportunity and uh, the state officials receiving those recommendations don't consider the rights of persons uh, with disabilities. Um, 
Of course, there are some committees or some, some opportunities that are more relevant for different topics. Uh, and this is part of the guidance that we kindly and we are happy to provide with uh, to national organizations when seeking to engage in different processes, depending on the thematic scope uh, by uh, each committee. Of course, we cannot um, we cannot go to, for instance, to to the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights to discuss the right to vote, which is part of the mandate of our committee. These kind of issues, quite. Technically, if you like, are important to get to benefit and use the best the different opportunities that uh, the calendar of work of these different committees um, offer to the different countries. That's it. Uh, I will just briefly mention the different opportunities that uh, national organizations have and the kind of things that we do to support uh, that work. Um, I understand that the, the colleagues coming after, after me will develop a little bit further in detail in some of those opportunities. Um, but of course, um, we have to begin with the, the possibility to provide to the different processes written reports. For this, of course, a lot of planning is uh, required and um, work in advance is very much required. I mean, as much in advance as the publication of the information by the United Nations committees allow, of course. Um, but on this um, alternative reporting, uh, I understand Stephen will be developing further on the practice at national levels. But for me, I just want to share that, uh, of course, under the CAPD convention for the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which is our main focus of, of work, we, uh, we tend to highlight the need that, those, that uh, the work of um, organizations is uh, comprehensive and seeking to cover the different issues uh, around persons with disabilities covered by the convention. And we usually encourage, which is not, but it's not mandatory, of course, we encourage that uh, the different organizations of persons with disabilities uh, work together in a joint report, because we understand that that process itself is beneficial for the disability movement at the national level. It brings a more strong and unified voice to the CAPD committee. It allows all the organizations to learn from each other and to understand the needs of each other. Uh, and it might lead to uh, the development of new uh, alliances or coalitions and so on. We have seen in our practice, which uh, relates to countries all over the world, uh, we have seen that out of the CAPD committee review process, which uh, is a work that takes around two years uh, in, uh, in total, depending on the, on the calendar of the committee, we have seen uh, the, the many organizations coming together and learning together, understanding those processes, and then carrying uh, forward the collaboration and the advocacy, especially. Um, of course, the, the reporting, I mean, what we report to the CFPD committee and then to other TTYs as well, is the situation on the rights of persons with disabilities at the national level and focusing especially on what the state has done or what the state has not done. Usually uh, in, the, in the discussion with colleagues on the national level, we usually find the, the tendency to speak of what the organizations of persons with disabilities themselves do. And sometimes it's, it's not only advocacy work, sometimes are projects or sometimes are uh, initiatives that, of course, can be very interesting, but uh, which are not necessarily the focus, uh, which are not necessarily the information that the committee needs to then assess the state. Um, I reiterate the importance of uh, learning about the thematic scope of each committee, and in, in any case, this might get a little bit technical in detail, but uh, <coughs> happy to discuss and at any point of time uh, any further, just to be conscious of time. Um, we, are, we, we don't need to go now in the different stages of the review process and so on, but you just need to take uh, into consideration that 
the moment that the CAPD committee includes a country in, in its calendar of work, it usually takes between one year, one year and a half uh, of uh, being following the process and two, uh, uh, at least two written uh, documents in two different stages. And then we have, and this is what I want to move to, uh, different opportunities to meet CAPD committee members. And on this, the, the pandemic brought some innovations as we are using also in this, in this event, which is the chance for remote participation. I understand, uh, of course, in, in many countries, uh, international cooperation supports national organizations to attend to Geneva processes. And I believe that some, uh, in, in some European countries, organizations might not have the resources to travel and all, all the all the things needed to plan ahead and in many occasions is voluntary work and so on. Now things get simplified uh, to some extent uh, to, to in, and we can encourage the participation even uh, remotely without any financial implication, which is not a minor thing. Uh, instead of having to travel to Geneva for three or four days, whenever it is the, the review of your stay, there is a chance to work on that. So this is an important advantage, and everybody got used to this uh, um, as a consequence of the, of the pandemic, of course, including the United Nations, to everybody's surprise. And um, so then we will have different meetings, which are uh, official in the case of the CPD committee, meaning in two different instances, the CPD committee gives room uh, gives time to, to discuss with organizations of persons with disabilities from the country. In private meetings, this means private, especially uh, regarding uh, state officials, meaning you can perfectly and safely uh, speak to the security committee on the issues on your countries. Of course, this might not be as sensitive in, in, in some countries of Europe as it might be in other countries but the committee gives this opportunity. And this is, a, this is very good of, this, of the CLPD committee compared to others in which uh, the only private uh, situation uh, provided is mostly informal, meaning when I say informal in the, in the environment of the UN, it means without interpretation in the three languages of the committee, without international sign, and uh, in, in any place that can be can be fine within the, the Palais Nation or online. But that requires a little bit uh, more of uh, preparation. Then uh, what we like, what we really like uh, doing uh, in advance of the session and so on is to create informal opportunities because we are aware of the <laughs> profiles of the different members of the different committees. We can identify the exact people that can be approaching the exact uh, topic that you want to discuss. So in advance and even during the session, we try to facilitate uh, a, a strategically chosen uh, informal meetings so that national organizations have, can talk and explain in safe spaces on and with time, uh, whatever they want to raise before the different members of the committee. Of course, the final goal of that participation, and uh, closing this, is that the outcome of all these processes, which are recommendations to the, your governments and to your states, include all the concerns that you have in the best way possible, with the highest level of detail possible, so that uh, state officials cannot uh, have any space for uh, ex uh, excusing lack uh, of uh, compliance with those recommendations. I'll stop here and I'll be around of course all day and I'm happy and look forward to your comments and questions. And if there is somebody that participated already, it would be great that you, uh, that you share also from your perspective, any insights on, on, the, on the work of UN Treaty Us. Thank you very much for your attention and I hand over back to Steve. Thank you very much, um, Jorge Garcia. And having attended a number of sessions myself, I've seen just how crucial the role is that the International Disability Alliance plays in helping national OPDs to really get their messages across 
both during the sessions in Geneva themselves, but also intersectionally. Um, and um, Ines, I'm going to need some help with my presentation yeah. because I'm going to take it that next step um, forward um, for the next few minutes as well, um, where I'll talk a little bit about some of our experiences at um, validity of taking part in these sessions and working with national networks of people with disabilities um, to engage in this process of periodic reporting under the CRPD. So we'll just get, and, and with my apologies to Ines, she did ask me for the presentation last week and I've only sent it this morning. So she's been very kind to help me with this. Thank you. Uh, it's coming up, just a Thank you very much. And so um, I'd like to build a little bit on what you've already heard, uh, particularly from Juan Ignacio, um, concerning this unique opportunity um, that the treaty itself provides to persons with disabilities and their representative organizations. Um, it is written into the text of the CRPD that states, of course, have to answer for their implementation of the convention. And I think the second preliminary thing I'd like to say about the CRPD committee in particular is that they particularly prioritize the views of organizations of persons with disabilities and persons with disabilities themselves when conducting such reviews. And so this provides a lot of opportunities at the national level to come together and to begin developing alliances that actually, um, in our experience, can uh, support ongoing national level advocacy for implementation of the convention, but also some systemic reforms. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about one element of that process, which is the preparation of shadow reports. I'm going to share a few examples um, and tips for how to do this. Um, and um, I'm going to then open up the floor um, after um, our next presentation so we can sort of share some strategies, I hope, that will support you. So, yeah, sure. So, um, uh, Juan Ignacio already started by explaining that the CRPD committee is a group of independent experts. And actually, those independent experts come from an election of governments that happens every couple of years in New York, governments that have ratified the CRPD. So the important thing to know about those 18 experts is that when they are on the committee, they must demonstrate their complete independence, of course, including from their own country um, that recommended them to join. Um, but in practice, getting elected to the CRPD committee does require you to have the support of your country. And so that's quite a political process. And that is something to bear in mind when considering um, how, um, you, when you're doing your research about committee members, how they got to the committee, what were their particular interests. The vast majority of them have been very, very active themselves in national uh, movements of organizations of people with disabilities. Sometimes they have worked in government departments on social policy, health, labor, international cooperation, etc. But I would say generally our experience is that once they are on the committee, the vast majority are very independent from the national and regional dynamics that they have to engage with during the election process. In the, there are three pictures on this screen. The first is a picture of Palais des Nations, which is the headquarters of the UN human rights architecture in Geneva, and it's in the winter. 
And so uh, sometimes sessions happen in spring, early spring, uh, and they are absolutely freezing. Um, and you can see here, it's completely covered in snow, the famous image of the front with many flags of all of the uh, countries of our parties uh, to the United Nations. And then there are two other pictures here, where what um, uh, I'm showing you here on the left, I think that's right, or is it on the right? No, it's on the right. Um, there's um, a group of um, representatives of organizations of Hungarian um, OPDs um, in Geneva taking part in the periodic process, uh, re re review process. And at the bottom left, you can see a much larger group. This um, was a group, um, I believe, that came from Uganda. Um, which at the time, uh, four or five years ago, was one of the largest OPD networks that took part directly um, in this periodic review process. And I would say our experience over the years is that participation is increasing at every session as OPDs build alliances, they get inspired by the advocacy of other OPDs, and indeed, at the most recent session of the CRPD committee, mem uh, committee, I think like one of the delegations was it the Japanese delegation had over 100 representatives of organizations of persons with disabilities providing a very strong showing. Now, that won't be possible in every country, of course, but I think the electronic uh, and the modern methods of connecting to the sessions really do have the potential of opening up much wider participation. And the other thing to know is that sessions themselves are live streamed now, nowadays on the United Nations web TV with often interpretation into the national language, which means if you're well organized, you can build a whole set of advocacy activities even around the review themselves. This is when a senior government official will give the official report to the United Nations and will lead the question and answer session with members of the CRPD committee. So I'm giving you a little bit of a sense of some of the dynamics here, because there are then many opportunities to engage uh, with this process. Um, just very, very briefly, the report, the reporting process operates as an official aspect of the CRPD under Article 35 of the Convention. Every state party that ratifies must, and I say must, submit a report on implementation of the Convention within two years of ratification. Thereafter, every four years, but, and this is an important but for you to know, there is a huge backlog at the United Nations of looking at these reports. This is primarily because of the lack of resources in organizing additional committee sessions. So it does mean that when your country is up for review, it is at this point more than likely it will be your one opportunity in a decade to get your issues before the United Nations. You are supposed to have two opportunities, but the practice these days, I'm afraid, and the timetable shows that you're only going to have one opportunity. And therefore, it is important to invest some time and resources into this process. Um, this is just an image that shows the cycle of the first report under the convention. The first stage is that the state party submits its own report on implementation of the convention. Secondly, the committee reviews this in something called a pre-session, closed to the public, and it adopts a, li a list of very specific questions, sometimes more specific, sometimes less specific, but a list of questions that the government is then asked to reply to. This process is the first opportunity for you at the national level to engage with the review process. After this, stage three, the state party then submits its replies to the United Nations, and those replies are made public. Both the questions and the answers are on the United Nations website. Fourth, the next stage is a constructive review, uh, constructive dialogue, excuse me. Now, this is very funny Geneva language, simply to say a formal discussion between the UN CRPD committee and representatives of the state party to the convention. And this usually happens over two to three days, depending on the format, in Geneva. 
and it is where a senior representative of the government, often accompanied by many public officials from ministries of health, welfare, social policy, etc. They all come along together and then there are sets of questions and answers that the government provides. It's around this process that you also have in preparation for this, your second opportunity to provide information to the committee once you have seen the state's report on the list of issues. Following this, the committee then closes during the same session, has a discussion, and they adopt a document, which can be no more than 10 and a half thousand words, approximately, where they, this is called the concluding observations. And the concluding observations are the committee's own observations on implementation of the convention, taking into account all of the information that has been provided and then providing a list of recommendations to the government in a, an article by article basis. There is one final stage, and this is often forgotten, I think, by OPDs, but also um, by other actors, is that the committee may decide that there are particularly important issues where the committee, uh, where the country, excuse me, is not making sufficient progress. And they can highlight these at the top of the concluding observations report to say this is quite a serious problem. This is a serious lack on the part of the state to implement its obligations. And this recommendation or these recommendations are subject to a follow-up procedure. And that means usually within two years, the state is asked to come back for a shorter opportunity to engage on a particular article or a particular set of issues. And in our work at Validity, one of the ones that often comes up is around implementation of Article 19, and particularly where deinstitutionalization processes are either stuck or going backwards. In, throughout your engagement with this process, you have the opportunity to suggest to the committee themselves that certain recommendations should be reviewed in this follow-up procedure. And that really gives you an opportunity for ongoing engagement with the UN, the UN Committee on this. How to contribute. So I, I've already covered this really, but just to say you have two main opportunities to submit reports. The first is to inform the list of issues, which literally means the questions to the government. And in that report, you should suggest the questions that the committee can ask your government. Okay. The second opportunity is in advance of the constructive dialogue, as I've mentioned, and that is where you can respond to whatever the government has said yourself and provide your own proposed recommendations. And this is really important. The third opportunity, which Juan Ignacio has also touched on, is the opportunity to talk with country rapporteurs. This is one or two members of the CRPD committee who will be responsible for leading the review of your country. They cannot be from the same country, right? So they can't review their own country, but usually the rapporteur comes from the same region of the world where that's possible. So they have some knowledge of the system. There's closed briefings that Juan Ignacio has already talked about, and I've mentioned the follow-up procedure. There are two images on here. The first is a group of representatives from Serbia or or organisations of persons with disabilities in a closed briefing. You're not really supposed to take pictures. Um, so this picture, I have no idea where it came from, Juan Ignacio. Um, but this is them giving a closed briefing to the CRPD committee without government representatives um, present, where they can give real information in the privacy of a closed briefing. And the second um, is a broader session that happened most recently, where OPD representatives can sit in the room and listen to the government. And that's very interesting, because although you can't speak, you can speak to committee members during the breaks. You can email them during the breaks and sessions and say, the government just said this, it's not true. This is the truth. Could you ask them this question? It's a really useful opportunity to do your advocacy. Okay. Um, I'm probably running out of time already, but let me go. What is a, so what is this thing called the shadow report? 
It's also sometimes called a parallel report or an alternative report. It's got different names, but they all mean reports that come from civil society during this periodic review process. They can be individual organizations or groups of organizations that come together to submit a report. Uh, NGOs can take part, civil society organizations, and usually your national human rights institution also submits a report. Um, not always, but they usually do. And what is the purpose? Well, it's to provide an alternative picture to the beautiful image many of our governments paint when they write to the UN. When you read the report that they submit to the UN, usually you look back at your own country and you think, I don't recognize this. This is not what I actually see in reality. And they're lying. And I've seen many people say to me, they are lying. They are really lying. Now, this is just part of the process. And committee members know that governments put the best picture forward. So they are very more, they are actually very interested in the alternative picture, that which comes critically from organizations of people with disabilities. It often contains the information that governments don't want to share or the want to hide, um, or that they are less likely to share with the United Nations. And as I've mentioned, it is a critical opportunity for you to get across the additional information the committee needs to understand whether the government is actually taking seriously its obligations under the CRPD. I, there are two pictures here of uh, groups of people in what are called group homes, which has become this model whereby people are being deinstitutionalized. One shows about 15 people in a yard, so that's a congregate living setting. And the second shows a big old building that's an institution with lots of independent living apartments. Of course, there are many, many people in these apartments. So you can share this sort of information with the committee to show them that the truth of the implementation is this, and it's usually very useful. I'll scoot ahead because I'm probably, I'm already out of time, but briefly, the structure of the shadow, and we can, I can share this presentation, of course, You've got a limit on space, 10,700 words, must be written in English, French or Spanish. One page is your executive summary, and that's where you highlight your top three to five issues. Focus the committee, don't overwhelm them. Focus them on what is most important to you. You then call, or you can decide to do a more detailed them thematic analysis on some of the articles that are more important to you. And that's really a question of strategy, I would say. Please don't be shy and don't waste space. Do not give the CRPD committee a history lesson on your country. They are not interested in it. <laughs> They're really more interested in your direct information and your proposals for recommendations. And I always say this, and people never do it, put your name, your phone number, and your email address on your submission because they will be in touch if they need further information from you and they will take that seriously. So some tips I've already said, get straight to the point. Don't waste your time with long descriptions of the history and everything. In the end, each article will be written about in one paragraph of text with one paragraph of recommendation. So you must be superbly focused. Be clear and direct. Mention specific articles of legislation, of policies, of procedures that you want changed. Don't be afraid to call out state parties when they lie. Make a decision whether you're going to go broad, cover the whole convention, or deep, whether you're going to look at specific themes. And decide this very early on, because you need to remember that word limit. It is super difficult to cut down when you've worked with 10 organizations and you have 20,000 words. Trust me, that is a nightmare you don't want to go through. Use links to reports, um, uh, but do summarize what's in the links because committee members rarely and they have a huge amount of information to look at and they rarely have enough time to get through everything. And do try to submit on time approximately a month before the, the, the session at which the report will be reviewed. Um, I'm going to scoot through very quickly now. You can decide to submit as an individual organization or as a coalition. There are costs and benefits of both. I would say in some countries it's easier to do as a coalition, 
But in other countries, you might decide that your national organizations don't sufficiently reflect the issues you're interested in. So you can be involved both in a national report with a collective and a separate report yourself. You have that opportunity. You should take it if you want to highlight it. Um, don't only go for the traditional voices who represent your communities. The committee is particularly interested in testimony from grassroots organizations, individuals with disabilities, those affected directly by the human rights violations which you are reporting on. So don't be afraid to include testimonies. It's often very, very powerful. And do remember that your reports are also published on the website of the United Nations. However, you can ask for them not to be published if there is specifically sensitive information or that you're worried about what are called reprisals. So the government basically coming back and being difficult with you. Doesn't end with the report because your report is an advocacy tool, both at the national and international level. You can use it to have meetings with ministries in your government uh, so that you can start the advocacy long before the United Nations ever gives their review. Use it to reach out to the country rapporteurs at the CRPD committee. Write to crpd at ohchr.org and say, I want to talk to the country rapporteur in advance. I want to give them more information. And finally, be prepared. Even with the best reports, the committee may have many, many questions for you. So around the time of the sessions, get your networks active. Get them ready to give practical, concrete information back to the committee so that they can ask really the best questions. I'm well over time, but here's your concluding observations. <laughs> um, they are issued at the end of the session, okay, at which the constructive dialogue has happened. The first section is called positive aspects. And believe it or not, that's usually quite short <laughs> because the committee wants to focus on areas for development. And that is the rest of the concluding observations. The concluding observations themselves do not create change. What creates change is your ability to pick them up, take them back to your capital, take them back around your country, advocate for them to be translated into your language, firstly, and your government should do that, not you. Your government has an obligation to do that. Disseminate them widely and build your own advocacy strategies. They're a powerful tool um, in which you can uh, continue the advocacy at the national level. So periodic reviews help you to build momentum help you to build the networks you need to strive for some real change. They're not on their own going to change their anything. The, the, the ability for them to create change is directly proportional to the amount of efforts you put in to developing your advocacy strategies around these important processes. And so on that note, I'd like to thank you very much and with a great apologies that I'm six and a half minutes over my time. Thank you. <laughs> so with that um, uh, complete, I'd now like to hand over to our final speaker, which is Heng Xu, who is a DARE researcher at the University of Maastricht. I can't say anything. So uh, I just, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Let me just set Thank up. You. Uh, uh, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, As Stephen said, we will send all the presentations to you. So, uh, to the share screen. And we press this button. Where is this button? <coughs> Already. There you go. So, morning everyone. My name is Tan Shiryu. What the? Oh, I don't think it's working. Oh, it just oh, okay. takes one second. Thanks. Um, but please feel free to call me Han. And uh, many thanks to Stephen for the introduction and uh, for Freedom Drive to invite me today to present. Um, so, I'm going to speak on the topic the role of the disability movement in promoting the international monitoring of the UNCRPD. Um, which is based on some of the preliminary findings of my PhD study, but also I think will be based on 
everything had discussed today. So basically, what I'm going to say is that uh, discuss is that um, so we participate in the EU mechanisms. Then what's next? What will happen? Is it going to really be impactful? Um, so I'm a PhD candidate based in the law faculty of Maastricht University in the Netherlands. And uh, my project is part of the EU funded scholarship. Uh, just mentioned the disability advocacy research in Europe, or we call DARE network, which consists 14 PhD researchers around Europe studying a range of topics relating to persons with disabilities. Um, so I tried to cover four points today. First uh, is my research background and the questions I am to answer. Uh, the second is research findings based on three EU mechanisms I studied. Then I will discuss on the implications and some research, some issues and challenges for the disability movement in Europe to participate in the EU mechanisms for CRPD reporting, uh, which are the last two points. And now um, I will start with my study. Uh, my study aims to examine the outcomes and uh, results of the interactions between national organizations of persons with disabilities in European countries, um, all called OPDs in short, with three UN human rights bodies in order to participate in the procedure to monitor the national implementation of the CRPD. So the disability movement in my topic actually refers to the OPDs from individual European states who are the main participants of the movement. Um, I studied three UN uh, procedures. The first one is a state reporting procedure of the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, or the CRPD Committee, which have discussed by Ignacio and Stephen earlier. And then the country visit procedure of the UN Special Rapporteur on Rights of Persons with Disabilities, or the Special Rapporteur on Disability, in short. And then the Universal Period Review, or UPR, the Human Rights Council. Um, so for this research, I conducted legal analysis, document analysis, observation, and interviews. And for the last one, I interviewed 44 informants uh, who are currently or formerly served at UN Human Rights Commission, High Commission Office, the CRPD Committee, international European national OPDs, and national human rights bodies, and other stakeholders. So I first gave an overview of the situation of 23 EU member states and one man, a former EU member, which is the UK. And then I focus on the three country studies of Denmark, France, and Hungary. Um, uh, anyone from these countries, uh, from our participants? Okay, I see some. So maybe you can tell me later whether my observations are accurate or not. Um, and then for today, I try to cover, give brief answer actually to the three questions. So how has the disability movement participating in the mentioned procedures? What international impact do these interactions have? on the international monitoring of CRPD, and if such impact translated into national effectiveness in individual countries. So regarding the international impact, I meant the broad influence of the disability movement had on the relative EU mechanisms I study. For example, if an OPD submitted shadow reports under the state reporting procedure, were the concerns and recommendations reflected in the CRPD committee's concluding observation. And by national effectiveness, I looking to the changes in law, policy, and measures that a state has adopted due to the international impact I just mentioned. Um, so now look at the three EU mechanisms I studied. Um, due to the time limit, I cannot explain everything in detail, but I will share with you some of the most interesting findings, I think. And if you have any further questions, I'd like to explain later during our discussion. Um, so in conclusion, I found disability movement has generated, I'd say, significant impact on the EU mechanisms, especially on the CRPD committee and the Special Rapporteur on Disability in the two procedures I mentioned. The input was valued and prioritized by the committee and the Special Rapporteur. The study also found evidence in committee's official documents, such as concluding observations, which indicated similarities in sentences with OPD's shadow reports. Among three mechanisms, the CRPD state reporting received a high level of participation from the disability movement. Only one state among 24 European states um, I studied received no OPD's public shadow report submission. And 61% of all civil societies shadow reports were submitted or contributed by OPDs. And regarding UPR, OPDs from umbrella OPDs and national disability councils who are usually members of, uh, who are members of European Disability Forum, were most active in engaging 
in you know, two procedures through submissions, briefings, and other formal and informal activities, uh, like like Nasio just mentioned. Uh, and they also receive lots of reports, uh, sorry, support from European and international um, OPDs, such as IDA. Uh, for instance, in Denmark, it was the Disabled People's Organization Denmark that coordinated and submitted the main civil society shadow reports in Denmark's both reviews and contributed to Denmark's UPR civil society submission. Um, all these achieved a rather limited impact, I would say, on UPR, probably due to this procedure being less prioritized among OPDs. It is understandable considering OPDs have limited resources and experience with the mechanism. Uh, my study also found that disability probably didn't enjoy a high priority on UPR human rights agenda as only 5% of all UPR recommendations in both second and third cycles focused on disability. So this may have contributed to disability, um, sorry, contributed difficulties among OPD representatives in lobby in the UPR session, hence the limited impact. And then the Special Rapporteur's country visit is an interesting case uh, because France was the only examined European states that have been reviewed, uh, so sorry, been visited. So its experience is probably quite unique, uh, but nevertheless, uh, there were a few OPDs and persons with disabilities participated during the uh, country visit, and mostly self-advocates. Um, they interacted and contributed to the Special Rapporteur's France visit through submissions, um, meetings, and uh, other informal interactions. However, France was not lacking disability organizations, or they called it disability associations there, but it's debatable whether most of these organizations fall into the definition of OPDs given by the CRPD. Similarly, in France's latest state reporting procedure, it was the self advocates most active in participation. The special rapporteur um, and the CRPD committee concerned that French OPDs were not authentically representative or effectively participated since the main disability legislation there conflicts OPDs with organizations of service providers and managers. And now turn to the national effectiveness. Uh, my study found that most reports, I found most reports on effectiveness of recommendations made by the CRPD committee. In the case of Hungary and Denmark, immediate changes in law um, in that country predict with the CRPD or European human rights law were made. The recommendations require one year follow-up in concluding observation, um, as Stephen just mentioned, uh, also showed a priority in taking action among the case studies. It's difficult to evaluate the effectiveness of the UPR due to most of such recommendations overlapped with the ones made by the CRPD committee. In terms of France country visit, the recommendations received a mixed reception among the disability organizations in France especially on deinstitutionalization. But it raised the awareness that the CRPD in the country and encouraged more OPDs to participate in the later CRPD reporting procedure. On the other hand, many may argue that the national effectiveness of the CRPD reporting results was probably not a direct result of the CRPD, uh, sorry, the committee's recommendation, as Stephen also just covered that, but also due to the national OPDs and other stakeholders' persistent advocacy and external factors such as the EU law and institutions. Uh, so it is worth it to note that even though recommendations um, were imp implemented, it may not be in full compliance with the CRPD and up to state's interpretations. So um, with that having said, what are the implications for OPDs in the future work or those who are interested in participating in international monitoring of the CRPD? Firstly, the main argument I made in my thesis is that the normative framework that is that is under the state parties of my, uh, sorry obligations defined in the CRPD Article 4.3, together with Article 33, provide the foundation and even determine to what extent OPDs can effectively participate in the exam even procedure and bring out the national effectiveness. These two articles first guaranteeing OPDs participation in national implementation and monitoring cantons through structured consultation and participation. Such participation will be influential in a later follow-up on the results of international monitoring. And together with later interpretation of the CRPD committee in the general comment number seven, these two articles further require states 
to support OPD support and ensure their funding independence, access to data, and authentic representation in the participation procedure, which are crucial for OPDs to conduct monitoring activities. And the second point I'll say is why OPDs should participate in the mentioned EU mechanisms, especially um, regarding the UPR and contributing, considering probably they don't have much impact on the country. I think the two most important reasons are the first to mainstream the disability agenda within the UN system, because it seems that disability issues are not are still not widely considered as a human rights issue. The second is to act the general watchdog role as a civil society organization, because um, to put it simply, the UN procedures need OPDs to ensure the CRPD is followed and uh, consistently interpreted and applied. The procedures can only be useful if we use them. The next point is on uh, strategy in participation. So um, my study found that whether OPDs participated collectively or individually, how they present the issues and recommendations in a comprehensive manner or only focused on certain priorities, whichever strategy seemed not to have dramatically affected the impact they had on three mechanisms, especially on the CRPD committee. However, it seems to be a good strategy to participate collectively to maximize the available <coughs> resources and build alliance and everything like when you so you just uh, mentioned. And at the same time, the, um, the coalition should try to reach out the self advocates and grassroots OPDs. I think basically all the strategies Stephen just mentioned is brilliant. I, I fully agree with that. Um, lastly, I would say OPDs had, and if not, should consider working with some of the most important allies, including the human rights bodies, academics, and other professionals, such as human rights lawyers, because my study found that they played an important role and sometimes equally influential in the exam UN procedures and domestic follow-ups. In partic particular, national human rights bodies among most European states, including uh, national human rights institutions, equality bodies, and other independent bodies are often appointed as the independent mechanisms under the CRPD Article 33.2. And they often equip with more uh, stable resources and have longer experience compared to some OPDs in dealing with the UN. In terms of human rights lawyers, I think uh, probably most people are familiar with the work of validity, which is also just present here, and I will not elaborate on that. So lastly, I just want to uh, address some of the potential issues and challenges to think about. The first thing that I also observe in my study is a possible decline of this participation in the international monitoring in the past years. And I'm not saying on a like a larger scale, because I also agree with Steve what you just said that there's more and more who is participate, but I'm more talking about within the same country that has been reviewed twice now. I can see that uh, probably that's um, a potential issue. And um, this phenomenon might relate to a decrease in, in resource available to OPDs, reducing interest and expectations in the CRPD among OPDs after the initial CRPD review. A general sh shrinking space for civil society, as in the case of Hungary, it's very obvious, and probably all about, about factors I just mentioned. And secondly, in particular to the CRPD state reporting, the backlog is affecting OPD's experience in participation. And some persons with disabilities also find their needs in participating in the sessions, uh, mostly on accessibility and reasonable accommodations are not met. But I'd say this is prominent among those who participated online due to the COVID-19 uh, measures. Lastly, I also see an unbalanced development in OPD participation within the country, as OPD from self-governing regions were less visible, and sometimes OPDs tend to not work in a cross-disability manner or within impairment groups. Um, so that's all I want to discuss today. Thank you very much for listening, and uh, I look forward to our discussion. And feel free to contact me with the email address I provided here, but uh, you can just Google my name. I think it will be my university page. And if you're interested in my topic or the DARE project, you can Google DARE Research EU and you can find our page and the social media pages. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very stimulating presentation and some really interesting interventions, I think, um, across um, the panel here today.
I hope it's given you um, an opportunity to reflect on, on how you might engage um, with periodic reporting processes, as well as other UN mechanisms and other international mechanisms. But I suppose more importantly, how this regional and international level engagement can boomerang back to support your national advocacy, which of course is much longer term than these points in time where the review processes take part. So at this uh, juncture, we have approximately, uh, we've got about another 40 minutes, I believe, where we can open up the floor to have uh, a question and answer and dialogue mm -hmm. session. I think what I'd um, uh, recommend that we do is we take a few uh, questions or thoughts from the floor. First, provide an opportunity for the speakers on the panel to give any responses um, if relevant, and, and then we can open up again for a second or third round, depending on how far we get on. So with that, I'd like to open the floor. Anyone who'd like to intervene, either with a comment, a reflection, or a question. How good. <laughs> I'll call a colleague. Does anybody want to start? Anyone? Yes. Please introduce yourself. Yes, I'm Dick Schwab. I'm from the Inclusive Education Foundation in the Netherlands. It's, it's absolutely necessary because the Netherlands doesn't have any right to education defending just issues in all schools. So I want to ask uh, uh, Stelios, as member of the European Parliament, and that's uh, also uh, is in the CRPD, is uh, how, what are your tools to uh, stimulate the Netherlands to make more of the implementation of the CRPD and especially education as education is the founding structure to enjoy all other human rights. Thank you very much. And if we take, uh, maybe we'll take a couple of other interventions. We'll collect two or three more and then we'll have some responses. Is there anyone else? Hi, my name is David Kaplan. I'm from Romania, the Association Sultawakis, which is the only organization created by autistic people that the advocacy of autistic rights. And the, the question I have is uh, how can we enforce uh, the creation of accommodations in Romania for autistic people? Because autistic people in Romania are viewed as just. <laughs> Um, sorry for the language, retarded people, and that's it. And without any need for accommodations and stuff like that, we are institutionalized or excluded from society or from any kind of learning establishments. Now, the schools are starting. A lot of kids that have this diagnosis are purely just because of their diagnosis, they're not being met, being excluded by. Uh, schools and the parents have been told, the parents have been pressured by other parents to exclude their children from the schools that they are creating a problem for the parents, for the other parents who are not autistic. And also to uh, finish the question, also to reinforce uh, the use of really, really basic treatments of autism that have been excluded like electroshocks uh, using the the ingestion of bleach and stuff like that uh, on kids that are being implemented by even healthcare professionals sometimes yeah, thank you we have one more on the floor uh Um, I am Sam from living in Belgium. Um, I just want to know how to get uh, in touch with this and European so we can make uh, the roads I do a little more accessible for wheelchairs. I've done it in the city where I live, in which we work in now. I've done a lot in the Jewish So I want to do the same or 
I'll try to do the same for you who doesn't. So it's easier to join the new chair and it will stay the train whatever you can use if you, if you don't have a party you can go where you want to go. Just if you want to find close things. Thank you. So I think we'll collect those three to start and perhaps then initially if I may hand the floor to I think there was a I think there was one question directed to Steos yes. concerning uh, education, inclusive education in the Netherlands. So perhaps I could give you that and any other points you'd like to answer. I don't have any specific answer especially for the Netherlands, but the problem is education, education and policy is a national competence. So we cannot influence how any of the seven uh, member states can facilitate the inclusivity into uh, so, uh, educational system. What we can do is to send to create um, opinion reports and uh, recommendations towards uh, member states, and if they want, they can implement we do really uh, legislation, but this is all what we can do. Yes, but education is a condition to get work. Exactly. If you don't get yes, educated, it's definitely. You're, you're discriminated. You're absolutely right. And, and, and this is the controversial issue. But yes, on uh, uh, on uh, on. I'm a, I'm a full member of uh, Employment Social Affairs issues. And on the Employment uh, Committee, we try to create these conditions to, in order not to create centered workshops and centered uh, working places. But on the other hand, you're absolutely right. I have no, answer, I have no specific answer, but I think from different point and creating all this good and uh, uh, towards the independent living uh, 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 amendments, it's towards the idea of creating something better for the future. But I think the, the problem, and another problem that I, 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 I say, I understand is that each of you, each of us, need to go to his or her uh, uh, deputy member of European Parliament and describe what is and what is not independent living. Because many of, many of uh, deputies misunderstood the meanings, misunderstood the inclusivity. They say that yes, we have special schools which are better for them, but we are missing the life. So it's our duty to go over there and say, look, you on this point you are wrong, on this point you are right. Because all this we can change. Thank you. Thank you. Um I think that's the end. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I would like just to react a little bit to, to the different questions, if I may. Uh, concerning the, I mean, I, I know it was not addressed to me, but it's interesting to to to, to recall that uh, actually the Netherlands is in the in the middle of the CPD committee review process. The CPD committee adopted uh, the list of issues, the first stage of the process, um, and uh, while it's still not clear when the rest of the process will <laughs> happen. Uh, there will be for sure recommendations in the area of education. That just to, to point out, and usually the CPD committee elaborates a lot. You see the length of the, those recommendations in Article 24 of the CPD. The, they have a lot of content. I mean, and, and the CPD committee has always uh, gave uh, in, has always given a very much of importance to this uh, to this topic. Uh, then I, uh, on this question, uh, uh, maybe it's a general remark. 
we have uh, the United Nations, the CFPD committee processes, we have the other committees processes, uh, Committee on Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, Human Rights Committee, Committee on Economic Action and Cultural Rights, and so on. It's important to grasp uh, in connection to Stephen's uh, last comment in his presentation, what are the expectations that we can put on those processes? Those processes are helpful, are, but need to be uh, considered uh, in coordination with our national activities and our national advocacy. Uh, I can recall, for instance, a case in connection to education uh, of uh, of associations in, uh, it was in Argentina, the country where I come from, utilizing the content, the recommendations coming from the CFPD committee to engage in uh, litigation in the area of education, which is uh, more or less a regular practice in Argentina since 20 years ago. So we need to, to, to reflect on how these processes can impact or can be utilized at the national level, as Stephen was pointing out. Um, because that's a way to go, probably, uh, for the colleagues of the Netherlands once the, the CFP committee issues the recommendations on, on, on the country. Um, a similar comment goes to, to from my side to the colleague from Romania. Uh, I, I, I know of cases of other countries where the, the, the CFPD committee put forward and requested, for instance, the stopping or eradicating uh, forced treatment of forced sterilization of women with disabilities, and the countries reacted and eventually either uh, repealed uh, administrative uh, regulations that still allowed for those practices, or even Supreme Courts of Justice uh, forbidding uh, those kind of practices, of course, after national processes as well that got uh, that made use of the things coming from the international. Um, I think that would be um, that would be all from my side. I I think it's important that we we do not conceive these processes that we have discussed and even the EU processes uh, in isolation from and in coordination uh, without checking what could be the potential coordination with the national process. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I'll, I'll just build on what Point Nasser just said and also general remarks regarding, uh, for example, how to improve accessibility in Belgium or how to uh, dealing with the forced treatment and what kind of um, measures taken in Romania, just mentioned. I think um, one thing I found in my research is that the most, uh, I would say, effective way to use uh, CRPD state reporting, especially the review, is that to find the, uh, the measures or the practice in a country that's in direct contradiction to the USCRPD. And usually that's the one to take, uh, I would say, usually immediate change. Because I see, I think in the case of Hungary, that's how they um, change the law on right to vote after the first review and also after the uh, the case in that brought, I think, also by Valentin to the European Human Rights Court on um, Keys versus Hungary. So that's that were two very important, I would say, one case law and also the CRP committee's recommendation. And also, it's, it's the same case in Denmark about the right to vote. So they changed the law eventually. Um, so, yeah, I think if you can find that, that will be a key point to. to um, uh, Entry points in chat reports. Um, yeah, I think that's basically the answer. Thank you very much. You make my job easier when you cover our strategic litigation um, as an organization, because that's one of the key processes that Validity uses with national OPDs um, and other organizations from civil society. On this question of enforcement, I heard the question of enforcement multiple times. How do you enforce the standards and how do you enforce the recommendations? So, so I'm a lawyer, so let me tell you the first thing that you need to know um, about the concluding observations of the CRPD committee, if we just talk about that, is that they are not immediately enforceable. Okay, and governments won't regard them as immediately enforceable. 
However, they're extremely persuasive um, for many, many different forums. And of course, for us as a legal advocacy organization, and also for you, you can use them in legal processes at the national level, in international um, judicial or semi-judicial forums, as well as at the European level. In Europe, we have two different um, quite useful bodies that can be used. One is the European Court of Human Rights, which can be used in cases where your national courts have failed an individual, okay? So where the human rights violation hasn't been found, such as the use of um, alternative behavioral therapies in Romania, you have an individual that's uh, been affected by these, you take it into the national courts when they give you a bad decision, you can use the statements of the UN committee when you go to the European Court of Human Rights, arguing that this is banned under international law, European law as well, the European Convention on Human Rights, and the statements of the CRPD committee can be very, very useful to make that case. So that's partially my answer to this question, is it's what you do with the statements afterwards. One form is the European Court of Human Rights, the second is the European Court of Justice, which we have been exploring more recently. Why is this, how is this different? Well, this is about questions of EU law, and it's the main court, where governments can be sued by the European Union, governments can sue each other, and individuals can sometimes, in limited circumstances, sue governments, okay, for breaching EU law. Now, there is a set of cases that uh, we've been privileged to work with on the European Network on Independent Living on state parties, including Bulgaria and Hungary in the first two instances, plus continuing to spend lots of EU money on building new institutions. Now, this is really hard type of litigation. It's a new area of litigation. But we are, for example, using the concluding observations of the CRPD from Hungary, as well as an inquiry report to go to the Court of Justice in Luxembourg to say, Hungary is using your money, Brussels, your money, European citizens, to build institutions, and that violates Hungary's obligations under the CRPD and the EU's obligations, importantly, under international law. So I would say uh, the, this can take a long time, but you need to use these in forums where you can get enforceability. That goes also for the question of inclusive education. Um, to the question that was on that regarding the Netherlands. And one case I would recommend to look at is a collective case before the European Committee of Social Rights, MDAC versus Belgium, the Flanders region, which looked at this topic and also used CRPD recommendations when litigating. The final thing on the question of accessibility, I believe that Enil has a TRIPS a project on this on this question of inf um, accessibility of infrastructure. So I encourage you to talk to colleagues uh, from, you know. I believe we have a time yeah, for go, go on, go on, I have something else? Yes, yes, of course. Yes, very, very quick comment. Yes, yes. Uh, we, in the uh, European Parliament, uh, we have uh, a committee which called the uh, CRPD Network, where uh, the idea is to, 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 to follow uh, the development and the uh, implementation of the uh, CRPD ideas in the web states. It's very weak. Mm -hmm. So my, my point is that around the, world, around the world, we have many, many, many tools and many possibilities of changing something. But the only, the only solution, from my point of view, is to raise our, to raise our voices. To go get to, to, to go outside and to, to, to speak loudly, to, to, to make a quantity a quantity lobby towards especially national governments and say what is missing from our uh, from our lives. This is the only tool that I have seen that with that is workable. And I think that. Uh, only if we if we connect our voices, we can change um, and we can see the developing ideas coming through. Uh, 
Um, I believe we have time for another round of uh, interventions. So yes, I, I know there was one here, and then I see. Uh, can you just keep show your hands? I'm just like I can't just see all the one, one, two, two, three, on. one, two, three, four. Thank you. Can I say please, something there on this? So I'm Mariana Parasteva. I used to work for the European Commission and the first mm -hmm. of May this year, and I have been working on independent living for many, many years, for the last 15 years at least. And on inclusive education, it is very, very important also to go mm -hmm. towards the parents and the families to, wear, to raise awareness mm -hmm. on the importance of having their children mm -hmm. in the mainstream with support. Mm -hmm because the problem starts many times from there. I can speak from my own experience because I have a son who has issues, he has autism, and I really struggle to get him through the, through the system. And uh, so uh, this is a first uh, point that I would like to, to make. And then when it comes to the accommodation issue, this is a very big issue. Because especially now that there is a lot of money for the recovery and resilience funds, we saw many small groups, homes being put in place, and also institutions in countries who so far have not at all invested, like Spain, for example. And despite the fact that we, as colleagues, tried to block all this, the higher top, no, they said no, because we want to spend the money. And this is an issue where the European Parliament also should be present. And uh, when it comes also to the latest uh, strategy that was adopted, the EU care strategy, I think it is a shame after what we have achieved with independent living to go back and talk about residential institutions. Because for me, the deinstitutionalization and the independent living are go hand in hand with a long term care. So. Yes, thank you. Exactly. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Suvan from Bosnia is speaking. Uh, I would like to say uh, that uh, we in Bosnia try both uh, processes uh, re related to uh, um, uh, report about uh, UNCRPD uh, implementation from the perspective of DPOs and also to influence UPR process, which is Bosnia and Herzegovina obliged to report every four years. For the first and second one, I think uh, Ignacio already mentioned the uh, importance of support to DPOs who decide to take part in these, these processes. And uh, I think uh, for, uh, from my perspective, is important to raise capacity of DPOs to take uh, opportunity and to participate in these processes, meaning that we need to identify the resources, uh, how to, to mobilize uh, the disability movement to, to monitor the, the, the uh, implementation of uh, human rights treaties within the, our countries. If we talk about UNCRPD, I think that state parties are obliged to, to, to uh, involve uh, disabled people uh, organization representatives within the process, uh, their process, but also to, to support establishment of the independent, independent monitoring system. And then uh, regarding UPR process, I think uh, our experience uh, was great because we, uh, we undertake almost all, all steps. And one of the most important is lobbying uh, state parties which are interesting for uh, uh, certain specific issues like education, like violence or discrimination or, or of women, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which then are able to raise a question during the process of discussion regarding uh, uh, status of human rights in 
different country. According to Bosnia and Herzegovina case, I must say after our submission of uh, alternative report for the UPR and then lobbying different states who are interesting for, uh, for specific issue, the uh, state of Bosnia and Herzegovina get almost uh, 14 specific disability recommendations uh, within the uh, final review process, you know, and that was really, really uh, important for us to raise a question through different channels uh, related to disability issue uh, in our country, uh, and also that was a great advocacy and lobbying tool on the national level, which we unfortunately don't use uh, enough as we can and that's another issue issue of resources disabled people organizations need uh, to have to to operate in a way they they, they 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 find important for disabled individuals in each specific country but i think that it, uh, uh, all of us uh, uh, here who are participating here need to find a way how to support each other, meaning that uh, international cooperation and contacts are really important. And we brothers, brothers and sisters across the globe and across the Europe are facing the same problem and uh, uh, in the beginning at the end need to support and understand each other. Thank you very much. So two more hands, it's one there. Well, I'm Heda Bukki, uh, I represent the uh, OPD Artistics for Finland, the umbrella uh, organization UCAP, which is for artistic led OPD specifically. Uh, question to Hanfi Liu, uh, touching on the same the theme as the previous comment, you mentioned resources to OPDs to participate in the review processes. As Finland country review is coming up next year, this is an urgent and relevant question to us. And finding it in, entirely impossible to increase participation by autistic people in Finland are very difficult because they actually need it. They're largely excluded, living in poverty, relying on unofficial help from friends and family members, living with the embarrassment and emotional strain of having to rely basically on charity to meet the basic symbols of human life. In that situation, it's very hard to tell people now start taking hours of your time to put into this very important course. Um, who or what bodies or organizations should we turn to in order to even begin to demand the resources that we should be able to see to participate in this work? Thank you. Hello, my name is Elizabeth Lip. I'm from the United States, um, but I am currently interning at the Independent Living Institute in Sweden uh, as part of my Watson Fellowship. And my question is a bit more general for any of you that would like to answer it. Um, how might you accommodate or balance potentially conflicting opinions or testimonies regarding disability rights? The disabled experience is so that and diverse. Um, so in your work, how do you validate and include multiple and at times potentially conflicting opinions? All right, unless there's any more, I think. Now, and of course, we uh, this is great that the discussion is opening up. Um, I suggest we go this way down the platform this time, if that's okay. Um, and I would invite each of the panel speakers also perhaps to give your concluding remarks. We have about 10 minutes, so we will close after this so that everyone is on time for your next workshop. So, may I give you the floor hand? Thank you. Okay, then I, I think I will just stress on the question regarding Finland and the people with the disabilities participating in the UN Kansas. Um, I think I will say uh, the case study I did on France, the people with um, psychosocial disabilities and autistic 
people or very similar cases as you just stated. And for, according to how I understand, it's like um, for the autistic people in France, also they find very difficult to get a resource. And uh, most of them, that's why most of them submitted individual submissions rather than collective reports, because it's almost impossible for them to work together and they don't have any support. And uh, also, um, they also participated online. I think in a way it made their communication with committee members very much easier and much efficient and uh, lower the cost of, for example, traveling to Geneva, etc. And I will say, uh, in terms of your question on who to turn to, I will say Ida based uh, definitely helped. Uh, <laughs> the, they received the uh, support yeah, from them. And also, uh, I know the organizations, self-advocates advocates in France, they also turn to an organization called uh, Autistic Minority International. Mm -hmm. They also participate in lots of U, uh, U, uh, CRPD state reporting procedure. They submit reports and they supported many self-advocates. So um, I hope that's true, uh, useful information for you. Thank you. Do you want to say something? Oh, yeah, thank you. This is yeah, Ines College. I mean, yeah, I was just, it's, it's more to, to maybe add to the question because I think it is uh, really hard for uh, European countries to get funding for this kind of work because the funding um, the funding that we are aware of um, uh, is, is uh, aimed at uh, countries in the global south mainly and uh, organizations here in Europe are thought somehow to automatically have money, I don't know from, from where. Uh, so I, it's just also to maybe Juan Ignacio would know because it, it is really hard to get, of course the governments will not give money to DPOs uh, that are going to use it to then uh, criticize them or they might, but I mean, it's very difficult. And also to be able to get that kind of money, you need to write applications. I mean, it's, it's very, uh, it takes time, energy, and and knowledge as well. Uh, so um, yeah, I think it is. I would also like to hear actually if if um, if uh, Juan Ignacio has some ideas. No pressure. No pressure. No pressure. Thank you very much. Um, so um, on. On, on this particular issue, of course, the diagnostic done is quite accurate. Um, I mean, this is international cooperation practices and historic, historically really, uh, determine uh, flows of, of funding, right? Uh, I mean, I recall in 2018, there was a delegation of 55 people from Nepal, out of which actually there were only 15 more or less actually working during, throughout the sessions in Geneva, while then we have these kind of situations in many countries of Europe. So from my side, what I can say is that uh, to the colleagues uh, from Finland and from any other country, the moment that your country is listed by the CFPD committee, uh, we get in touch immediately with those organizations which are uh, either members, members Generally, the, the umbrella organizations are always there. And then whomever wants to contact us to try to engage, whether they are part of an organization which is coordinated with the, any AIDA members member or not, we are happy to, to include and uh, provide the technical support and eventually logistical support uh, in Geneva. And so that the person would be me to contact on that. So happy to share uh, contact information later. I'm not, uh, I mean, for now, the CAPD committee has not even published the information of the session for March 2023. This is how the United Nations operates for now, unfortunately, especially after the, during and after the pandemic. Uh, for the future, there are ongoing discussions on the on the different treaty bodies, not just the CP committee, and adopting a predictable calendar. Allegedly, in, in, in less than one year, or God knows when exactly, but we should be able to plan much much better in advance. So for now, the only thing I 
can uh, share informally and, and, and ask you not to publicize is for the colleagues of Luxembourg, if they are in the room, if there is anybody from Luxembourg, to get ready uh, because we will be contacting you soon. Um, and then, uh, as I was mentioning, I was uh, actually was a purposeful comment. The online participation went quite well uh, in, in the cases of, of, of France. And that's a, that's a possible way to, sorry, thank you very much. So that's too close to your lips. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, so that's a, that's a way, uh, that's a method we, uh, we, we can count now. And eventually one thing that we usually do whenever the country is listed, if there is any possibility uh, to have an on-site uh, national workshop, in coordination with the national organizations, we try to do that. And uh, that sometimes the source of funding for that might come from different uh, stakeholders. I would suggest, and I have very much in mind the example of the colleagues from New Zealand, uh, raising this, the discussions connected to Article 33, uh, 2 and Article 33, 3 of the Convention creates an opportunity of, uh, for national organizations to uh, collaborate closely with uh, national human rights institutions of the, of the countries. And when I say collaborate closely, I also mean uh, benefiting from this, the funding that they might have as well because they might also come to support national organizations of persons with disabilities. I, I recall the, the, the example of New Zealand because it's, it's a, to some extent a very good way that the colleagues of New Zealand found. They discussed with the National Human Rights Institution and with the Ombudsman Office, they created the independent monitoring mechanism and they take turns in who directs that mechanism. And the OPD is without uh, having themselves uh, to seek for funding, they, they have uh, influence on the concrete work being done by the National Human Rights Institution within this context. So it's a, it's a way that to, to seek some stable uh, way of uh, support and collaboration at the national level, which is not at all a minor thing. Uh, of course, it depends on the relationship that you might build with the national economic institution in your country. Uh, on the issue of funding, the general comment seven of the security committee on the issue of uh, OPD's participation has a lot of language that supports and that explains the obligation of the state to provide funding for organizations of persons with disabilities uh, for capacity building and for participating in the in the monitoring processes at national and uh, international levels. Uh, and then just to tackle the question of conflicting opinions. So here, at least when reporting to the CFPB committee, we, we are talking to, to 18 uh, people that represent uh, a, a committee that has a history of jurisprudence, has criteria already developed, so first, uh, there, uh, first guidance uh, there is, there is no need to present to the CFPB committee opinions that might be contrary to its own jurisprudence, in the sense that, I mean, you might do it, but it might be a waste of time, uh, simply because they might not change their mind, uh, unless you have a very strong case on what you are developing, right, in line with the CFPB. And uh, when it is opinions within the disability movement, the preparation work towards the dialogues with the CFPB committee are a moment on which uh, agreements can be reached and differences can be approached. And eventually, imagine if there was a coalition report, if there is any conflicted issue, it won't can go in that report. Organizations can present it separately if they need. Sorry for the, the long time. Yes. Very quick. One, one problem that we also face, and this is goes to the opinions, is how, who represents the same people in the, in the national level. So is, is it suitable, the, the organization that says, yes, we are representing the same people, is it suitable to represent, uh, and how? 
who consists the boards, the board, uh, the board directors, <coughs> the directors of the board directors. So these are the answers that we need to get in order to understand who represents what. And uh, to to solve this, this uh, this is a problem that we need to be solved on the ground from the different associations and different organizations to solve this conflict and to ask from the governments to say who represents what. Uh, I, I know uh, because I think that we miss we missing the 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 the. the the origin and the aim of disability without understanding who is who. And uh, to finalize my the, the, uh, the invitation, thank you. I would like first to thank you, Emil, that invited me, that uh, feels again that I am part of it because I am part of it. And for all of you, whenever you have an idea, uh, an opinion, uh, something that you believe that the uh, European Parliament can give you an opportunity to raise your voice and to have an opportunity to, 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 to say something, please contact with my office. You can find my contact details on the internet. And uh, I will be very, very happy to contact with you and to have a discuss for the issues that we are, uh, we, we are, we are here today. Thank you, thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. Um, firstly, let me thank um, Enel and everyone who's been involved with organising this brilliant first panel, um, and for everyone who's volunteered as well and who's supported. It's been great. Let me thank you also to all of the panel members who have contributed to this first workshop um, on uh, monitoring human rights violations. Um, and also thank you very much for the very active participation here. I think we've opened up a lot of really important discussions already. This is one of the most exciting aspects, in my opinion, of the Freedom Drive um, and the connections. I don't want to give a very long response to all of the questions that were asked, but um, I would say that my organisation, The Liberty, focuses on the human rights of persons with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities, as well as autistic persons. So we would be particularly keen to support organisations that are and activists who are advancing those causes. We are very, very deeply concerned about the new European Union care strategy, which I understand undermines a lot of the progress the independent living movement have been making here in recent years. And I think, I hope, the opportunity today, tomorrow, Wednesday, will be for to really raise our voices and say, no, 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 we don't need to go back to the old care paradigm. We actually need to be acknowledging the philosophy and respecting the autonomy of the living. Um, I would also, uh, I won't add anything more on the resources I've to say. It is always, always, always challenging that the European Union, in my view, has tools where it can uh, support the involvement of people with disabilities in both international and European processes. And so the hearing at the European Parliament tomorrow may, uh, tomorrow, yes, may be an opportunity um, to make this message very, very clear about why these resources um, need to be provided and need to be provided not just to national networks, but also to independent living activists and individuals involved in this work. Um, and finally, um, I, I'll close by wishing you all a, a brilliant uh, freedom drive. Very much looking forward to getting our voices on the streets because the high level international advocacy is great, but it's also really important to be visible and to be proud and to be seen on the streets. And so thank you very much all for your participation and I look forward to our discussions continuing for the next few days. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone, uh, just some practical information. So the next workshop here uh, is in an hour at one yeah. one o'clock, and it is the workshop on uh, youth. Um, meanwhile, if you want to, uh, we have some coffee and snacks here, but if you want to get something to eat there, places, uh, just kind of lunch, uh, lunch places, you know, where you can pick up a sandwich or a salad around here. Um, what else uh, to say? Um, yes, yeah, so for those of you coming back here, the next workshop is at, at one. Uh, thank you to all the speakers. Thank you very much.
thank you very much. Let's uh, let's stop. Uh,